Hi, this is Rick, and the next six slides will provide a brief introduction to the histology component of your medical education. Answering the question, what is histology, seems a good place to begin, though you will see that arriving at an answer is not a simple matter. The typical dictionary definition is that histology is the study of tissues. Histo means web or tissue in Greek. However, you may not be entirely sure what tissues are. And in this case, the definition is not very satisfying. We will discuss tissues in a few slides, so don't worry about that for now. The term histology began appearing around 1850, along with advances in the construction of light microscopes and related equipment. Although it will take several more decades to develop the theory and components required to make light microscopes of the quality we use today, the instruments at that time were improving and scientists were developing techniques to study all parts of the body using microscopes. So perhaps a more useful definition of histology is that it is microscopic anatomy, the study of the body's structures using a microscope, in contrast to gross anatomy, which uses only the unaided eye. Today, microscopy includes many tools, such as an electron microscope. This introduction will only consider some basics of light microscopy, however. In practice, then, histology is the observation of stained sections of parts of the body using the microscope. Thin sections of body parts are required in order to be able to shine light or electrons through them so you can see something. And stains are required because most biological material is colorless. You need stains to create contrast between different components. This, then, is how the term histology is commonly used by clinicians. A family practice doc, for instance, may remove a skin growth from a patient's arm and send it for analysis by a pathologist. She might call later and ask, well, what did the histology show? The pathologist will have prepared and stained sections from the sample and examined them with a microscope. Given years of experience, the pathologist will be able to classify the appearance of the sample as either normal or showing signs of some pathology. The histology is what the pathologist sees. The diagnosis of normal or abnormal is an interpretation of the histology. At the beginning, your job will be to learn what normal histology looks like for all the organs in the body. Though we will show you some abnormal material as well, both because it's interesting and also as a useful contrast with normal. For us, histology is really concerned with the microscopic structure of cells and organs in relationship to their function, physiology, molecular components, genetics, and diseases. Histology is cell biology and physiology, with an emphasis on the structures involved. Cytology is a related procedure that we need to define now in order to distinguish it from histology. Cytology involves a microscopic observations of stained cells, but it does not require sectioning. In some important cases, one can obtain cells from the body in a suspension that can be analyzed directly without sectioning. For instance, blood cells, swabs from the mouth, or samples from the vagina, that procedure is called a pap smear, and samples obtained by sticking a needle in an organ and withdrawing material called fine needle aspirates, can be placed on a slide, stained, and directly examined because the samples are thin. This diagram shows the steps involved in making a blood smear with a micrograph on the right showing stained blood cells. This is a very common procedure. Some of you will get to observe this directly in the course, and we will uh, be looking at smears of blood and bone marrow cells in the lab in a few weeks. Now, histology implies sectioning biological material before staining and observing it with a microscope. The typical sample preparation involves several steps and takes a considerable amount of time in some cases, from many hours to more than a day, depending on the urgency with which the results are needed. You can follow the steps in this diagram, starting at the upper left with obtaining a sample. This may be a small bit of tissue removed from the body, a biopsy, or a small portion of a larger piece that was removed during surgery. Samples are kept small, both to speed up the subsequent processes, which are diffusion limited, and because only small areas are needed for observation. The sample is then fixed or treated with chemicals that cross-link and denature proteins and other macromolecules. 
This kills the cells and keeps the large molecules from moving. It's like hard boiling an egg. Heat denatures the egg proteins so they stay in place when you remove the shell. After fixation, the sample is dehydrated, treated to remove water, typically by running it through a series of increasingly concentrated alcohol solutions, ending at 100% alcohol. The alcohol is then replaced with a different organic solvent, a step called clearing. The second solvent is used to introduce a material like wax or plastic resin, which will infiltrate the sample. When that step is complete, the wax is allowed to harden or the plastic is polymerized. This embeds the sample in a very hard matrix that will allow it to be sectioned. Sectioning is done with a machine called a microtome. It moves the sample up and down, each cycle advancing it towards a knife a fixed short distance, such as 5 microns, to make thin sections. The sections are then collected on glass slides. If the sample was embedded in paraffin, that's removed with organic solvents, the sample is rehydrated and treated with stains. Finally, a clear mounting medium is added and a thin glass cover slip is placed over the section. When the mounting medium is dry, the slide is ready for the microscope. As mentioned earlier, staining sections is required in order to create contrast between different parts of the cells. Most biological material is colorless, with the exception of red blood cells and some pigmented structures, such as found in the eye. There are many different staining mixtures designed for revealing different things. Probably the most common stain used in histology is a mixture of hematoxylin and eosin, called H&E. This is certainly widely used in pathology laboratories. Hematoxylin is a dark blue molecule that is positively charged. Therefore, it binds to acidic structures, such as the DNA package in the cell's nucleus. It stains nuclei dark blue or purple. Eosin is a pink-red molecule that is negatively charged. It binds to basic molecules, such as the arginine and lysine residues on proteins. This tends to give the cytoplasm a lighter red, orange, or pinkish color. Below is an H&E stain section of rat liver. The nuclei of the liver cells are round, so they appear as dark blue circles here. The cytoplasm of the liver cells is colored in magenta in this case. You will find that H&E stains result in a wide variety of colors. This is due to variations in the composition of tissues, in the many steps involved in preparing tissues, and in the actual recipes and age of the stains, which may differ from lab to lab. This inevitable color variation is one of the things that makes histology challenging. The bright red clumps inside the circle are groups of red blood cells, which you can see have stained quite differently than the liver cells in this example. However, red cells won't not necessarily look like this on other slides. Sometimes they're very pale. Well, now that you have an idea of how slides are prepared, let's go back and consider the nature of tissues. A formal definition is that tissues are groups of cells, along with the products that they produce, that share similar structures, functions, and in some cases, embryonic origins. This is a complicated set of criteria which may not be all that helpful to you. To make things more concrete, histologists have determined that there are only four tissues found in the body. You'll better understand what tissues are as we study each one over the next few weeks and then look at all the organ systems in turn. For now, very briefly, the four tissues are epithelium, Epithelial tissues are found at body surfaces, such as the skin and the respiratory and digestive tracts. Connective tissue. Connective tissues are found throughout the body, providing general support, such as blood supply, and just holding things together. Muscle. Muscle tissue is specialized to shorten or contract. Muscles allow you to move about, pump your blood, and propel food along your digestive tract, among other activities. Finally, nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is specialized to gain information from the environment, process the information, and control the activities of the body, which ranges from thinking to sweating. As we go through this unit, you will see that all organs in the body are composed of combinations of these four tissues. Although the concept of tissues comes from work that was done mostly in the 1800s, it has stood the test of time and still provides a useful way of understanding normal function and recognizing disease. Well, let's end by taking a quick look at a section from the small intestine, where all four tissues have important activities. To get oriented, the abdominal cavity, which is found at the bottom of the slide, you will see a label appear dramatically at the bottom right. 
This is inside the body. The lumen of the intestine is a small opening at the top. This is topologically outside the body and where food, which is called chyme at this point, would be found. Look just below the label for the lumen and the E appearing identifies the epithelium lining the surface of the intestine. You can see that the dark nuclei are elongated ovals in this tissue. That is because the single layer of cells in this epithelium are very tall. The job of this epithelium is to move nutrients from the lumen across the cells to be picked up by the circulatory system. The small intestine has a complicated geometry, and if the section happens to pass through the epithelium in a different orientation, such as it does to the left, you'll see the cells cut in cross-section so that the nuclei look round in that area. Orientation is another complication you have to get used to when you understand the microanatomy of the sections we'll be looking at. If you look to the right, you will see a CT appear, which identifies a large area of connective tissue. You can see that there are many nuclei here and not very much cytoplasm. This is an area full of small cells of the immune system. You know that the gut is full of bacteria, so it's important to have cells ready to protect the body from invasion. Further down and to the left, you will see another CT appear. This is also a connective tissue, but in this case, it clearly contains fewer nuclei than the area above. This is a denser connective tissue with more extracellular material that provides mechanical strength to the intestine, and it also contains blood vessels and lymphatics that support the entire organ. This dense connective tissue can be used to make a casing for stuffing sausage, just to give you an idea of its strength. But just below the dense connective tissue is a layer of smooth muscle indicated by M. You can see that the nuclei in this layer are elongated ovals. This is a band of smooth muscle that wraps around the circumference of the intestine. Just below that is another layer of smooth muscle, where the nuclei appear as small circles. This is a band of smooth muscle that is running longitudinally along the length of the intestine. These two bands of muscle are involved in propelling the food uh, along the length of the intestine. If you look to the left, you will see a clear area between muscle bands. This is a bit of nervous tissue that controls the ner that contains nerve cells that are involved in controlling the activity of the smooth muscle bands to efficiently mix the chyme and transport it along the intestines. There's also a bit of nervous tissue to the right. But we will look at slides like this several times during the unit. You will learn to identify the different tissues present and the cells that they contain. Later, you will look at these slides to identify the organs made up from these tissues and relate the organs' functions to the specific structures they contain. We will also show you some slides in class in the lab where pathology has changed the organization of these tissues. Histology gives you both a rich vocabulary for describing the body and a set of images that many find useful for relating anatomy to function. Don't worry if much or all of this is new and somewhat mysterious at the moment. Over the next few months, I promise that this will become much more familiar.